Hey, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, Growing Concerns uh, webinar for uh, June the 27th. Uh, we're uh, going to be uh, going through uh, the usual crop update to start with, and then uh, we have Jane Thornton on today, and uh, Jane's going to uh, go through a few things what's happening to our alfalfa crop. We've been getting quite a few uh, calls on the uh, our alfalfa from alfalfa producers and uh, and the crop, and uh, there's been some issues there. So we got Jane on to uh, give us kind of an, an update of what's going on there. Linda is on holidays for uh, this week and next week, so uh, Karma Lewandowski from uh, Minnedosa will be uh, the, the person handling questions and uh, helping us organize everything, so thanks Karma. And uh, I guess with that, uh, we are going to start the webinar. I guess uh, to start with, uh, last night there was a pretty good weather system that came through from uh, from the west and uh, dropped a fair amount of rain in some areas. I know the uh, Shoal Lake area probably got anywhere from a half to three quarters of an inch. And I think that one kind of followed 16 Highway. To get farther south here, I don't think we got quite as much, but uh, there was definitely some, some strong winds and uh, I did notice this morning a fair bit of the winter wheat in places was launching and uh, we'll probably come back up, but uh, we definitely had a, a weather system that came through with high winds anyways. Not, nothing major like uh, we were hearing reports of Saskatchewan so far where they were having some, uh, some major wind events and some touchdowns and stuff, and, uh, but we, uh, we still definitely got, uh, got a system that came through. I guess uh, I'm going to start with some of the oilseed crops since this is some of the things we're seeing in this past week uh, with the oilseeds. Uh, we're definitely seeing uh, the, a lot of the canola that uh, was sown a little bit early starting to cabbage out and starting to bolt in the southwest here. And we're getting into that stage where we're starting to get in calls from producers regarding uh, fungicide application for steratinia control. So uh, that's going to probably be happening over the next week here and as producers are getting uh, the canola into that 30% bloom stage, we'll be hitting the fields with a lot of the fungicides. So uh, depending on whether we could see uh, a fair bit of this happening in, uh, in a short period of time. One of the things we're seeing out in the field that I've been getting a couple calls on is uh, on Liberty Canola. It's pretty common issue from year to year and it's just when you get the right kind of weather conditions in your spring Liberty, you sometimes get a burn on the leaves and it looks like a bronzing or almost a rust on the leaves and, uh, and that would be a burn from the Liberty. And mainly what's happening is the plants are growing and they're so lush and the conditions are right for the plant to take in a lot of product. So what's happening is they're taking it in and actually getting some effects from the product or from the burn from the chemical. But never seen an issue with it. They've always outgrown it. Uh, basically, it's just a matter of uh, the leaves that were there when you sprayed uh, get a little bit of a browning and the new leaves come and, and it's good to go and never really ma any major issues with it. Sticking with canola, uh, I don't know if you've been traveling around and seeing uh, many of these, uh, these traps out there. These are the Bertha armyworm traps and, and um, we got a couple calls yesterday that were kind of interesting. Um, we got the, uh, this, uh, this scouting group to uh, actually send me the pictures. Uh, they uh, uh, got a tra this, these traps and this trap is, was right full of Bertha armyworm moths. So uh, said they counted them and uh, they were right into that 900 I think in, in the trap. So uh, uh, numbers have gotten high in some areas. Uh, this area is in that, uh, there's a strip from from talking to them, there's a strip from basically the Brandon Hills through Wallanisa down to the Glenboro area where they were getting uh, fairly high numbers, anywhere from 300 to 900. I think this trap here for the 900 was uh, was the one at the Wallanisa site. Uh, they said this, the, the tub was right full and uh, they were wondering if some of them couldn't even get in if they wanted to. So, so uh, definitely numbers are high. So uh, I guess start to uh, to let us know that the, the, the moth is around. I guess the biggest issue, and we've had it before where we've had high numbers 
and it never became an issue. But uh, just to let us know that they're there, these moths can lay quite a few eggs, and uh, they'll be you know, starting to lay their eggs, uh, you know, right now, and uh, they'll lay them on the under undersides of the leaves of the canola crop, and uh, as the canola starts to mature, these uh, eggs hatch, and then the larvae are the ones that are doing going to be doing the damage. So. Uh, Spraying for the moss is, is not economical, but uh, when it comes down to the larvae, that's when monitoring will have to be done. And in some cases, uh, there were, last year in some cases in the southwest here, we did have some isolated spraying happening. So I guess just a heads up, uh, there's just another picture of the trap to show you how full it was. And uh, there's just a little bit of a close-up of the, uh, of the, this is the one I had in one of my traps. The traps that uh, I had in Cirrus and Cromer areas uh, were only giving me five and nine and ten sort of things, so our numbers were still fairly low. But again, you know, uh, I think uh, we will get hot spots in areas, so just, uh, just a heads up. When I was in the Tilston area, I uh, was pretty sure I seen one of these guys yesterday. I uh, I didn't have my camera with me, but uh, when I went on to the uh, insect update from John Gavlosky, he said that they were uh, getting some reports that there's the odd one being found in Manitoba. There's been found, some found in the Swan River Valley, and um, they've been dealing with it, I guess, for the last couple of years. Um, I was positive that this is what it looked like, uh, and uh, so. Uh, I'm going to, next time I'm up in that area, I'm going to take a, a closer look to see if I can find uh, any more of them and maybe catch some and get them set away for identification. But uh, it definitely did look like uh, the cereal leaf beetle and uh, numbers are still fairly low in Manitoba, so it hasn't been a, a major issue and there has been some uh, natural predators that are reducing the numbers. So um, I guess just... Uh, uh, one of the things I guess we're seeing when we're walking through the fields now, there's so many things going on between disease and insects. Uh, you always got to have a heads up as to what you're looking for because there's several things that are going on. When we were in the winter wheat field, uh, I guess this, this past week, uh, we, were def we were starting to see some wheat stem maggots. Uh, you can see that uh, just the, the white heads you pull on the head and it'll come right out of the out of the node and pull right out of the sheath. Um, maggot is chewing on the in, on the, on the stem up from the inside down below, basically causing the head to ripen prematurely. They look fairly noticeable in the field. Uh, producers see them, get really concerned, but uh, the percentages are always so low that it's never really an issue. So control measures there. Are, are not not warranted and uh, because the insect is actually on the inside of the stem there really is no control measures anyways because you wouldn't be able to get contact to the to the uh, to the larvae that's feeding on the on the stem but when we were out there I was out there you could see that a lot of the winter wheat has completed flowering already you can see the anthers on this one on the outside of the the blooms already a lot of these ones already, the blooms are closed, so uh, a lot of the winter wheat crop has been sprayed for fungicide already, and uh, and producers are now looking at uh, spraying some of the wheat, uh, the spring cereals, and barley. Uh, a lot of that stuff will be probably heading out within the next week or so here. So a lot of producers are starting to get get started with those ones. While we're still on the cereals, um, I did have a field. Uh, uh, this past week that uh, had experienced hail damage, I guess, a couple weeks ago, and uh, the field uh, was oats, and uh, it uh, we sent samples away, and it did come back as bacterial blight in the field. Um, it since has outgrown most of the symptoms because we've had some warm, dry conditions, and the new leaves that have come out have actually been uh, nice and clean. So I think uh, the issue is uh, is not going to be an issue in that field, but uh, you know, we we have the humidity, we have the right conditions for a lot of these secondary diseases to start uh, coming into effect when we do get uh, an injury to the plants. A little bit about uh, spraying flax. Uh, 
seems that uh, for some reason we always uh, get caught when we're spraying flax and it gets to be a little bit too tall on us and uh, this field is probably 10 inches tall when, or 8 to 10 inches tall when the producer went out to spray it and definitely in a situation where you're going to do some damage to the plant you could see the, the looping of the plant and the S shaping of the plant uh, basically taking up enough of the chemical that uh, it's starting to affect uh, its ability to grow and uh, I guess the, the I guess what I wanted to bring up with this slide was uh, get out there early to spray the flax you know the two to five inch stage of, of the flax growth is probably your best timing uh, the other caution I guess is with the weather we're having right now it's uh, it's almost going to be impossible not to do damage to the flax so everything you can do to uh, reduce the stress is going to be important so spraying in the evening is definitely uh, something you should be looking at doing um, if you can and if it's possible split applications of your products so splitting your grassy weed out from your broadleaf weed and doing two applications would, be, would also be easier on the crop just because when you throw in your grassy weed with your broadleaf weed herbicide your surfactants uh, heats up the broadleaf weed and causes more more stress on the plant so if you can do a split application uh, if it's getting to be this height uh, I would definitely do it because this is going to be something that will be affecting the yield on this crop because it's going to take a while for those plants to come back from, from that damage. Just starting to get a couple calls regarding peas and uh, so I figured I'd put the, these slides from last year in. We're getting producers uh, wondering about aphids and peas and, uh, and you know what they should be looking at and what kind of numbers they should be looking at. I guess the big thing with peas is a lot of the peas are just nicely going to start flowering here probably over the next week and one of the cautions I always uh, uh, just talk to them when I'm talking to producers is if, uh, if they're on the plant the peas can actually handle quite a, quite a large number of aphids per plant. The biggest concern you need to watch is where they're feeding. So if they're feeding on the lower leaves and the, and the stems you know you can have fairly large numbers and it's not being an issue. Where it starts to become more of an issue is when they start feeding on the on the flowering parts of the plant and uh, when you get a situation like this where you've got 20 or 25 right into that flowering part of the plant, they can cause that flower to abort and when that happens you get no pod developments and you, uh, you're starting to lose yield. So uh, when I'm out in the field looking for uh, aphids and peas. I usually look uh, look more towards the flowers than I do of anything, uh, just to see if they're up in that area. If they're in the lower parts of the plant and then feeding on stems and leaves, uh, they pea, pea plants can handle quite a large number. Yesterday, when I was uh, out in the Tilston area. Uh, we're in a field of Glen. Uh, this is not the picture. I didn't have my camera with me, so I do. But this is just a picture of rust from last year. But uh, we did find rust in a field of Glen wheat yesterday in the Tilston area, and kind of surprised us. We weren't expecting it to be uh, there that early. Um, it wasn't in the flag leaf stage yet, and uh, we didn't find a lot of it. But we were able to find it, and it was definitely rust because it was wiping off on your hands and. And as you run your your hand or your fingers down the leaf, you would the rust would wipe off onto your hands. So uh, we're definitely seeing some uh, some rust in that field. Uh, we didn't see any in any other field, but uh, I guess that's just a maybe a caution to us that uh, maybe rust has maybe moved up a little bit earlier this year. So it'll be something to be watching for. With that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jane now, and Jane is going to talk a little bit about alfalfa. So, Karma, if you want to turn it over to Jane.
Jane, when you're ready, you can go ahead. We're not hearing you, Jane, so just unmute yourself and then we'll be ready to go. Unmute. I had unmuted mine. You are there. unmuted. Yeah. Okay, am I You're ready? Good. You're ready. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, I am going to go then. All right, good morning everyone. Uh, we have been getting reports of ALF Alpha Weevil. Um, ALF Alpha Weevil has been in the province for a number of years. I was first made aware of it in about 2000 and it was very sporadically uh, over the province and seen some years I would get no reports of it and other years I would hear about it. Um, what I find is that uh, beef producer, hay producers are probably the least aware of it um, because they just kind of wait till sort of a certain time of the year and then they go out and cut their hay and I think you really do need to be having a look to see whether or not it's around because it is pretty much everywhere this year. Um, what ends up happening is you will be sitting waiting for your crop to start blooming because a lot of beef producers wait for early flower before they want to go out and cut. And this is a picture that Brent Elliott took in 2008 and you can see July 31st this field was still not blooming. And that's usually a pretty good sign that something's going on because certainly by the end of July it should have been in full bloom. And uh, so you need to be scouting your fields and if you're seeing anything like this where you think it should be blooming and it's not, you'd better get out there and start looking. And the other thing that this field doesn't show up very well is you can see there's some areas that look a little bit grayer and the alfalfa weevil will often come into a field and you'll just see sort of this uh, whitish or grayish patch and if you walk out there you'll find that all the leaves have been skeletonized and we'll see some pictures of that in a bit. So we're just going to look a little bit at the life cycle of the, <clears throat> the um, uh, alfalfa weevil. And this is an adult alfalfa weevil. And they're not that big. You can see an aphid beside it. And you can see that they're not that big. But the, the actual weevil is not what really does the damage. It does very little feeding. It's the larvae. But the life cycle is, is that in the fall, they move to the outsides of the fields so sort of the headlands and that kind of stuff to winter in the you know the um, any any sort of uh, downed forage or whatever you have on the edge of the field where they can find to get down close to the ground and make a nice nest for themselves to to survive the winter. Then they move in the early spring in May. They move back into the alfalfa fields and they lay their eggs in the stems in approximately about May. They, each female will lay about six to 800 eggs and the eggs are laid over a period of about a month. And then, of course, when the eggs are laid over that kind of period, then they also do not emerge at the same time so you can get numerous generations coming out. Um, the alfalfa weevil, like I said, is not that big. It's about five to eight millimeters in length. So then the larva. Um, <clears throat> After the eggs have been laid, depending on temperature, uh, if it's very warm, they can mature very quickly. So eggs <clears throat> will hatch and start to, the larva will start to uh, emerge in about 4 to 21 days and this starts to happen in sort of mid-June to July. Um, they then, the larvae are the part that does the damage and these larvae will move to the top of the plants and they'll start feeding on the developing leaves and the flower buds and the damage starts as small pinholes and it progresses to what is called a skeletonization. So they eat out all the green stuff between the veins. And there's three molts that go on. So as the summer progresses, they get larger. And we'll see some pictures here. So when they first hatch, they're very small. They're a few millimeters and they can grow to approximately a centimeter length. But the, that would be quite a large one. And you can see in this pile that came out of uh, a net, you can see a fairly large one here, and then you can see there's also some very tiny ones, this one here. 
And this kind of creates a problem because with them hatching over the long period, you can build up quite high populations, especially with the cool, moist weather we have because, you know, they're a fairly fragile bodied larvae. And when they're hatching, if it's cool and moist, then most of them survive and then they start feeding. And here's a person's finger in here. This is typical of what they look like. They have a white stripe down the back. And even though you can't see it on this one, you can see it on these ones. They have um, a little black or dark brown head on them. So that kind of distinguishes them from some other sort of larvae that are out there. So they always have this white stripe and this dark head on them. And <clears throat> when the feeding gets very bad and you haven't been checking your fields, you can see how much is not left of this leaf and how it's turned white. And that's the skeletonization that they're talking about. And your fields will literally start to look grayer and grayer and whiter and whiter. <clears throat> and you're not getting any more yield because the plants are being eaten so much by these little bugs. So then you need to go in and think about what you're going to do in terms of treating them. The next stage is, is they feed and they feed quite heavily and when populations are high they can do a lot of damage and you can lose a lot of yield and of course your nutrition in your plant is in the leaf and they eat most of the leaf so you're also losing forage quality. So they do then move into, I think, the end of July or so, they make these loosely woven white cocoon masses in the alfalfa plant. And that's in sort of that late June, early to mid-July period. And they're about one to two weeks in this stage. And then the adults emerge, but little feeding. They do little feeding. So really what ends up happening is the adults just kind of hang out. And then they um, mate in the fall, and then they go back to the field edges and overwinter. So here we have the adult emerges in the spring after overwintering in leaf litter and it does very little feeding. So it's not the part that does the damage. It then lays its eggs. The larvae hatch. They're the ones that do all the damage. So that's why we're starting to get calls on it now. Then they pupate in the field and then basically the adults emerge and they, they don't do, they just do a little tiny bit of feeding and then they're kind of inactive to the fall when they mate and then the adults over winter. And here's kind of what you'll see in your field. When it's mild you'll see a few holes like this kind of thing and as it gets worse you start to see more and more and more and then eventually you can see like the whole tip of the head is of the alfalfa plant is eaten off here and of course this plant is not going to flower so if you're as a producer waiting to see oh my plants are starting to flower and I'll be going out soon um, you really should be walking out there and having a look to see to make sure that these pests we had a very mild winter and we had a cool wet spring so I think that's probably ideal conditions for high populations of this bug so what are the thresholds well you're going to go out and look at leaf tip damage and then you're going to count weevils. So if you have less than one larva per stem, you basically no action at this point. You're just going to monitor. But if your alfalfa is less than 12 inches tall and you have more than one larva per stem, then you're going to spray or cut. And <clears throat> spraying is usually the guys who are doing seed and cutting is usually for people who are going to take hay because spraying is kind of expensive and cutting, what it does is it uh, takes the feed source away from the larvae and again I said they're fairly fragile bodied so basically just the process of drying the hay down and exposing the ground to the hot sun and wind and that sort of thing will actually kill a lot of the larvae. If your alfalfa is six, about 16 inches high and you have two larvae per stem then for sure you're going to spray it or cut it and if you have th three larvae no matter what you're going to spray or cut. And also, if there's about 40% leaf tip feeding and 2 to 3 larvae per step, stem and more than 7 to 10 days to harvest, then you're going to spray. Or, again, you may just move your uh, <clears throat> harvesting date. So, we'll con control actually a very effective control because they're such fragile bodied insects so that desiccation of them will usually take care of it 
However, when populations are really high, the poss there's the possibility that enough will survive that they, it is not enough just to cut. And so in those cases, basically what you're going to have to do is those larvae that survive after, the, after your haying process are going to feed on the regrowth. And so you need to go out to your field and monitor your stubble regrowth. And so generally alfalfa, if we have good weather, is fairly quick to jump back up after haying. And if you're finding that it is not, or you have patches in the field that are not greening up, then you need to go out again and look for these little larvae because probably what's happening is as the alfalfa comes out of the ground, they eat it. So if you have two or more larvae per crown, of course now you do not have the option of haying it again, so now you do have to go to a spring. And if you have four to eight larvae per square foot, you're going to spray. <clears throat> So the sprays that can be used are all listed in the guide for field crop protection. Uh, Saigon Ligon will suppress only. Um, there's others, Matador, Silencer, and Desis are all synthetic pyrethroids, uh, but they do not work above 25 degrees Celsius. And so right now we're in a very hot period. So if you're going to try to use these, they probably will not work for you. So um, this was something Brent uh, Elliot put together back in 2008 and then at that time the interlake, this was a pretty new pest to it and when you have sort of these good years when it's uh, you know ideal conditions, so cool wet springs um, and the pest is new in an area, you will get outbreaks that are quite bad and it's because there's no natural enemies established for the <clears throat> alfalfa weevil. If you are south in southern Manitoba, it's a pest that's quite widely distributed now. <clears throat> you know, I can find it almost anywhere, and whether or not it's problematic is mostly related to um, weather, you know, whether the weather is, is good for it. So, or possibly, if you have a bad, then the natural enemy, enemies that are, are around all the time, plus you have that wet weather, it will trigger an outbreak. So <clears throat> that might be why we're seeing some outbreaks in other areas. <clears throat> the natural enemies, I didn't go through all the different kinds, but there's a number of funguses that will attach the alfalfa weevil, and there are so some things that parasitize it. So there are a, a number of natural uh, uh, predators, so when you're looking at those thresholds of whether or not you're going to spray or not, you have to kind of keep in mind that if you're going to spray, you're probably going to kill all of the natural insect uh, predators of it too. So Hang or cutting might be a better scenario for most people to try to allow the natural enemies to build up. Um, outbreaks arise from the natural enemy population being low, weather conditions. I think this last winter being very mild meant that a lot more of the alfalfa weevils survived the winter. And then of course we had cool moist weather which was ideal for them. And establishment in new areas where there's no new enemies, I just mentioned that, and it requires some time for the natural enemies to move into an area, so you, it's kind of a waiting game. <clears throat> outbreaks, outbreaks usually typically last approximately five years, and this is an interesting comment from Brent Elliott's prediction in 2008, and he, at that time, he, he gave a presentation at the Forge Symposium, and he said we were in about year three or so, and he predicted that in 2008, so that would be 9, 10, 11, well, we're maybe at the top or max, or maybe because we've had two wet, wet cool springs in a row, we have had perfect conditions to keeping populations high. So in summary, uh, it is a new pest for some, but populations are generally high in most regions, so outbreaks are possible. Um, remember the life cycle and target the right stage at the right time. So really that's, you know, if you're starting to see feeding damage and have those threshold populations, then you probably want to cut your hay or knock your hay down as soon as possible. Um, to spray or not, again, it's the larvae count and consider the plant height, and, I, and to me also it depends on the value of the crop. Um, I think spraying can be fairly expensive. Um, 
So if you're just wanting cow hay, you might be better off to do a, a, a cut. If you're a seed grower, then you're probably going to be spraying. And of course, if you have cut and then you're having feeding on your young plants, then your only choice is to go to a spray. And that may also depend on whether or not you're seeing it sort of over the whole field or whether or not you have one patch. And you may have to spray before or after a cut, so that's just the reality. So that's all I have on the alfalfa weevil. So I suggest most people get out and scout. And when you're looking for when it says one or two alfalfa weevils per stem, well, I'll tell you, they're really hard to see. They're often on the underside of the leaves or they're in the crux and you really can't see them. And because they start out so small, you may not see them. So one of the things you can do is cut a stem and put it in like a five gallon pail and then shake it and see who falls out of it. Um, and do that for uh, in a number of places and s that's one way of kind of figuring out how many you've got because they're very difficult to see on the on the actual stems and you'll probably have to cut and pull that stem out fairly um, gently because a lot of times they will just drop off and you usually can't see them on the ground they're very small so once you get knowing what you're looking for then you will start to be able to identify them. But cutting those stems, putting them in a pail and giving them a shake will knock the alfalfa weevil off into the pail and then you can look for the little green worms with the white stripe and the little black head. So that's all I have on the alfalfa weevil. So if there's any questions. I don't have any questions for you at this time, Jane. Okay, well thank you very much then. Jane, before you go actually, uh, I have a couple questions for you. Oh, thank you, Lionel. Yes. Uh, one is going to be on seed quality. So one of the questions I got from one of the producers was that he markets his hay. And is there any concern with them being baled and being in the sample? Not that I know of. Um, if you go down into the states, I think the alfalfa weevil is just about everywhere down there. And as far as I know, it's completely through Manitoba now. Um, that is a point, though, because there is some speculation that the alfalfa weevil made it into the interlake through hay transport. So it may have had some adults that, of course, are a beetle and they're hard-bodied, so they may have survived <coughs> cutting and baling and survived. So it is a possibility, um, but the alfalfa weevil, I think, over North America is pretty much established almost everywhere. Yeah, his comment was that because it's affected the 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 hay, uh, the, it it dried up a lot faster than it normally would, and yeah. because of that, they he was concerned that they might not be dead by the time he bailed it. Yeah. Yeah, they might not be. Is he planning on, I, I guess that his question would be to, to find out when he's going to be shipping that hay into an area that's alfalfa weevil free. You know, okay. be a little bit proactive about it. Um, but, is, uh, you know, like people ship hay everywhere, so I guess I would find out if the area already has it, and if it is, then it's probably not a, a big deal. If it's an area that's not, then he may want to hold that hay back. Okay, the other question was uh, from a producer that just planted his this year. And he was wanting to know like thresholds on, uh, on, on those plants or if there was even going to be an issue in those fields. Would, like, would the weevil be in a field of, that was, say, cropland and then all of a sudden he sowed its alfalfa this year and, it's, uh, and would the population still be as high? Has he actually found weevil in that field? No, just kind of talked from neighbors and then he was saying, well, geez, what about my stuff that I just planted, he said, so. Yeah, um, I would keep an eye on it, but my, my thought would be it would take probably a year or two for the, for the weevil to get over there. Yeah, that's I what mean, I they was can, kind of thinking. They can fly, but I don't think they're really big movers unless maybe you get a, a really good wind and they get carried over. But we're almost getting um, into this season when the feeding will be slowing down. Like certainly the larvae will not move over there, 
So it's more, he probably will have to look for next year because they only feed on alfalfa. So if he didn't have any alfalfa around there, he will not have really adults in the area and he certainly won't have the larvae traveling over to his field. So I think it's more for subsequent years. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, the only other one comment I got this past week was uh, that uh, the, from, the, from the beef guys that if they're cutting a little bit later than uh, the dairy guys that would the second generation affect the, or would the second cut be affected if they're maybe be gone by then? And I think you answered that with, you know, the timing of the, the hatching of the worms, eh, of the larvae. Yes, yes, but if you cut and the larvae don't have anything to feed on, they, they will die quite quickly. It's a matter of when that, whether or not they cut and there was a high enough population that enough of them managed to survive the cutting and hide in the leaf litter down below. And then when the regrowth starts, because these plants come back so quickly, they'll start feeding on the regrowth. So it's not necessarily a new hatch. It's the larvae that are already there surviving the, the first cutting and being around to eat the, the regrowth. And I have seen that in, before. And you just kind of think, well, that field should be starting to green up, or you notice patches that are not greening up, and people are wondering why that is. And it ends up it's the larvae that have survived the haying process and are now feeding on the regrowth. So that's what they should be looking for. I do have a question for you now, Jane. OK. Will, will a heavy rain wash them off, and will they climb up the plant again? <laughs> uh, unless, you know, they got hit directly by a very hard uh, raindrop or uh, you got hail on it and it actually hurt them. But them just getting knocked off a leaf down to the ground, they will easily climb back up if they're not damaged. And so I wouldn't count on rain because it's the cool, moist conditions that actually keep them around longer. So I don't think that would really... Uh, be a control mechanism for them. Okay. Uh, and any other questions, Karma, or is that it? No, that's it for right now. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes. If you want, thank you, Jane. That was good. And this was a picture that I actually took. Uh, about a year ago, I guess, uh, maybe two years ago now, and uh, like Jane mentioned, you got the, the definitely the white stripe on the on the back, and you can see the feeding on the on the leaves, leaving the skeleton type look to them. With uh, with that, uh, kind of had a little bit of an abbreviated uh, uh, webinar today. Uh, there was. Uh, um, you know, a few things going on, but it seems like we're in a stage right now where we've got a lot of the weed control still being done and fungicide application either nicely going or just starting in some areas. So um, everything seems to be going as, as, uh, as planned, I guess. Producers are looking at some fairly decent uh, crops in some areas out there, so I think a lot of the fungicide is going to be applied. So. Um, uh, again, as normal, if you've got questions, uh, there's my, uh, my, my contact information and, and Linda's. I do and have then, another uh, question right now for you, Lionel. Um, have, you, sure. have you heard anything about wheat midge? I haven't yet. Uh, we still are probably uh, a little bit early for um, uh, scouting for it. Uh, usually you're looking at... Uh, uh, you know, heading um, um, normally for winter wheat, we haven't uh, haven't been seeing too many issues with wheat midge in winter wheat because it's just the wrong timing for. It. But uh, with the cereals going to be starting to head, uh, you know, right now, probably within the next week or week and a half, we'll start seeing uh, seeing them out there. So I think. Uh, I think that's going to start happening or start scouting uh, for them soon. But uh, when you look at the forecast maps uh, produced, uh, uh, there definitely still is uh, an area 
from the Saskatchewan border kind of through the, um, I think the last time I looked it was up in that Yorkton through the Russell, that type area where they were maybe going to be a little bit higher than some of the other areas. But uh, I think over the last few years we've definitely all been able to see wheat midge in a lot of the fields in the southwest. So um, monitoring just kind of nice to get going on them. So um, I would think by this coming week or the next webinar we'll probably have some information on that. That's all of the questions I have for right now, Lionel. Okay. Well, uh, we'll uh, see everybody next week. I'll get an agenda out next week. I uh, got behind a bit, and uh, Linda always was helping me with my, reminding me to get my agenda out, so I never was able to get it out this past week, but the agenda will be flying out next week, and uh, uh, we'll go from there. So thanks, everybody, for attending, and we'll see you next week.